Good afternoon and welcome to Business Eye on Dublin South FM. Wow, what a week it's been over here in the UK and around the world. And uh, I have to say, we got two wonderful guests today talking about some very controversial subjects. And obviously, we're going to stay within the bounds of governance in this conversation. But uh, I'm, I'm going to get quite head up, I guess, because uh, the whole subjects around gov government and housing and, and all those kind of related issues are really, really big issues and for somebody like me who spent four years on a on a house a homeless charity in australia um i'm really fascinated by this so we've got two uh, our two guests are rosalind doherty uh from Fi financial Fi foundation welcome hi simon thanks for having me today you're welcome and it's great to see you and then seamus may you wear many hats so i'll let you introduce those different hats so welcome to the show yeah uh, thank you simon delighted to be here with you and you and and, and i'm, I'm Delighted you both here, and Joe's about to join us in a second. And uh, so I'll kick off. I'll kick off by uh, really, uh, Rosalind. Just give us a bit of an introduction as to what Financial Foundation is and and what the aim is. Okay, the Financial Foundation was set up um, three years ago, authorised, regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland, um, and basically the company was set up to try and deal with people who are in in danger of losing their home and in danger of their, their home being repossessed by the bank. So I'm, I'm independent from the banks and I act as a middle party between customers who are in serious arrears and in danger of, of losing their home and the banks. So I okay. negotiate any arrangements okay. to keep the people in their homes. Okay. Is that the same as the likes of BAPS? Is it BAPS or MAPS? Oh, MAPS. 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 Like, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it? better. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, um, yeah. Well, yes. Well, people do. 90% of my customers would have previously gone to MABS before they, they come to me. Um, I have a, a bit of a gripe, I suppose, with the state agency, whereby they're, they're telling people that they're insolvent and that there's no arrangement there for them and forcing them down the insolvency route, whereby when they come to me and I can see straight away there is the potential there to have an arrangement and, and, and keep them in their home. So I, I really feel that the state is lacking proper advice to, to customers. So would you call yourself the negotiator or the arbitrator? Uh, a bit of both, yeah. A bit yeah, of both. Absolutely, it, yeah. It, yeah. And how many clients would you be dealing with at the moment? I, pr I have about probably two, 250 to 300. 250. And I'd say another three to 400 inquiries that have come through. And, and the reason I'm asking is, is it, are these issues the fallout from the Celtic Tiger? Are these new issues that are fought or that are appearing now? A bit of both, but mostly it's a, it's the hangover from the Celtic, the Celtic, the Celtic Tiger. Tiger. Yeah, mm. where people were given these massive mortgages. You know, some people on social welfare were given mortgages, but they shouldn't have got. Um, or they were in, in high paid jobs and then the recession hit. Um, again, there's mm. marriage breakdowns, illnesses, redundancies. Well, yeah, they finance, all have yeah, an effect. Financial yeah. um, stress will will cause you know marriage breaks. Absolutely. Like what do a lot of marriages break up over? It's it's finances. Yeah. You yeah. know the yeah. issue with that. Yeah. yeah. I, I believe if any marriage can go through a difficult finance, it's a marriage for life, really and truly. Really yeah. Honest. And that that would be yeah, my feeling yeah, as well. Honest. Yeah. The so will it your deal? with it's to follow from the Celtic Tiger it but it, is there new people coming on stream now are, are these just people who are still fighting after the Celtic Tiger again a bit of both um, a lot of people they've never managed to get their arrears fixed and this is the issue with the banks whether if, if the customers are still paying the mortgage and if there's arrears still sitting there this is where the banks have a major issue so they want all those because they're, they're down class as non-performing loans and bringing down their their books and, and, and their readings every year um, so it's in their best interest to get these mortgages fixed keep the people in their homes Mm. and um, mm. try and negotiate a deal rather than kicking people out in the street and adding to the mm. the homeless crisis that we already have. So, so banks are part of the establishment. I'd like to segue over to Seamus now and uh, and talk about your areas and, and uh, I think you represent, you're involved in three or four different bodies. So maybe just give you a bit of an, in, uh, give us an introduction as to, to the yeah. various hats you wear. Yeah. Well, um, I suppose this year, I'm, I don't know if the word celebrate is correct, but I'm uh, uh, celebrating our 40th uh, uh, a year, our 40th anniversary of leaving UCD with a with a commerce degree. I was working for several years before that, part time running a business, really since my teens. Uh, and uh, I started out life in the construction sector, construction materials. Uh, 
um, uh, cement quarries, concrete, asphalt, all that, all that sort of uh, material, and uh, had a lot of issues with uh, allegations that we were put out of business on many occasions. And I started uh, into competition law proceedings back in 1996. Okay. So we're now uh, almost uh, 23 years since we issued proceedings and really going nowhere. So in, in the meantime, in more recent years, I, I kind of, I applied my experience and expertise that I've got in competition law and corporate behavior and the behavior of associations, etc. And I've, I've studied quite a few sectors. Uh, I've done a report on the beer sector, the beef sector, uh, right. the, the bread sector, the banking sector, uh, construction materials worldwide. <clears throat> so um, nowadays, I, I, I do a lot of work in the area of white collar crime, uh, corruption, uh, competition, law and enforcement and you know there's a common uh, platform there, there's a common problem which is the need for political reform across the board okay. and uh, like uh, in my own case and with seeing all these people that are in front of the courts uh, with banking issues etc there's a huge issue with access to justice in this country so yeah. there's a lot of issues uh, and I, I, I tend to be sort of uh, uh, horizontally involved I'm involved in a lot of different areas Yeah, yeah, yeah so where do you even start with that? I mean, so when you talk about political reform, what aspects, uh, to what depth are we talking about? Are we talking across the board? Are we talking about the whole ecosystem? Can you break yeah. it down a little well, bit? <coughs> funny, I'm just, I've just returned from a, a, a trip to the US uh, where, where I attended a, an agricultural conference. And the theme of the conference was that corporate power has gone too far. I mean, corporate power has literally taken over the entire US agriculture sector, just as it has over here in Ireland. And it's been done. Uh, it's been done because uh, corporations nowadays are allowed to capture and have captured governments. And this is an issue not, not just in Kildare Street in Ireland, it's over in, in, in Brussels and you know unless and until we, we reel in corporate power I mean this is what's going on with the beef plan at the moment uh, there's massive demonstrations against corporate power yeah. so when corporate power uh, becomes too much and when regulators are not doing their job be, yeah. e either by design or whatever reason the effect is that the wrongdoers uh, are being protected yeah, yeah. but, but it's, it's to do with lobbying really to, to, you know money money has power and yeah. money solves all problems and you would agree with that as mm -hmm. well that if someone can pay their mortgage they'll, they'll easy pay it and it solves the problem and governments they're looking at political systems are looking for what's in it what how can we stay in power and how mm -hmm. can we make ourselves look good to get a vote in for the next election yes. and the lobbyists then come along with the power and as you said with the meat I, we we could do a whole new different program on pharma and we could talk pharma in Ireland and, and Europe and in the States as well but, but I, I just want to jump back to something there you said you were celebrating and uh, you were uh, 23 years um, is that in, for procedures? Oh, no, well, I was, I was uh, celebrating uh, 40 years from leaving, uh, leaving UCD but with a commerce years. degree. Uh, but I'm 23 years in court now, in so court. Since, since we issued proceedings. Yeah. Be sh very shortly, 23 years. Yes. Okay. Just, to, just so people know... Um, for what? Okay, my family alleges that not once, but on four different occasions, we were put out of business. Uh, okay, so for out of business. Yeah. Okay. So under competition law and competition law enforcement, that's that's the area we we say that that um, uh, people companies with uh, uh, market power were in a position to force us out of the market. Not only us, but many many dozens and dozens of families in Ireland over the years have have been evicted out of the construction material sector. It's interesting because if you look at looking at Ireland and we we count ourselves as very much you know part of the USA. The mentality when you know mm. seventy million Irish around the world, thirty five million in Ireland, and if you look at if you follow looking at just what you're talking about in, with America, America really don't give a feck about the CEO. It's all about gaining. I, I'm reading um, Richard Branson's book at the moment and what American companies have done to other Ameri to his company to try and push them out of the to business and I was shocked to believe that there's companies out there that will do and I know of people in companies at the moment that there's been tactics used from other companies 
to get them out of business. Mm-hmm. Would that be the same of what really happened with yourselves mm-hmm. as well? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's very easy. Once you achieve market power, once you become vertically integrated and horizontally integrated, you can do anything you want. The only, the only way that small, medium industry can be saved or protected is by enforcing the laws. The US has particularly strong competition laws, they're called antitrust laws, are there since 1890. Mm-hmm. But it turns out that over the last number of decades, they have been, their enforcement has been diluted and diluted well, and diluted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, over here, we've never had enforcement. We Quite simply, we have a competition authority here since um, 1991. And uh, you know, it, it's effectively a laughing stock throughout the world because it has achieved, uh, it achieved virtually nothing in 20, 28 years. On it. So, with the, the large organisations, and, and we survive on multinationals here. And if it wasn't for the multinationals, a lot of people would not be employed. And we know that the multinationals get large breaks because the government do the math and go, hang on, if they get a tax break here, X amount of people are employed and that's bringing money into the system. But that's going back to yourself is. Is that the issue as well, that you have a lot of people who were, I'm, I'm asking the question, were they self-employed or were they working for different organisations that got themselves into difficulty? Because you mentioned people that were unemployed that got, got loans, but I'm, I'm talking about people, entrepreneurs, are a lot of them coming to you? Yeah, there would have been a lot of self-employed people where um, their businesses crashed because there was absolutely no assistance for them whatsoever. Um, and then you have the, the case that we're self-employed, weren't getting anything, any help from social welfare. So in some cases there was no incomes at all coming into to homes, but you could see some of the bigger companies, um, Coca Cola and Drada, for example, like they had a, a massive workforce and they they pulled out. So a lot of a, a lot of people who would have had joint incomes coming into the homes just devastated overnight. And and with that devastation comes overnight. I'm surely if you owe the bank and you ring up the bank and say, look, I'm having an issue at the moment. I can't, finances are coming in, can we put a stop on this mortgage loan? And the banks will agree and say, yeah, we'll do a a six month stop on it. Um, And then putting that six months stop on it, send us in all your bank statements Mm -hmm. and everything and we'll work on a payment plan. That's what's happening with a lot of people at the moment. Is Is there some stage that it's gone beyond that? That, you know, someone in the bank, correct me if I'm wrong, are the banks not saying, okay, if you owe a mortgage of two grand a month or a thousand, but you give us two, three hundred or fifty or hundred, it shows that you're making oh, an issue towards it. Yeah. And there's one of the other issues as well, that people, when they get in difficulty, they won't talk to the banks yeah. and they hide. Yeah. Mm. There's an awful stigma that goes along with mortgage arrears and being in debt. I mean, people, some wives won't tell husbands, husbands don't tell wives, they hide letters. Customers often come in to me with a plastic bag of, of letters that have been unopened, but all they're really doing is compounding the issue. But yeah. Yeah, so it, like really, you know, I really want to say to people, don't be afraid to engage with no, banks. Communication. Yeah, is. and always, no matter how bad your situation is, try and get some sort of payment in mm. to the mortgage on a monthly basis. You know, just don't leave it hanging there with no payment going in. Whatever you can afford, get something in. It just shows a willingness to engage. One issue we might catch up after the break, but uh, to get back to Seamus, is I'm interested. You, so you, I think you represent Transparency International here in Ireland, is that right? Well, I'm a member of Transparency International for many years in Ireland. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm interested, and we'll talk about it after break, about <clears throat> what you think about is there. Is there, you know, the, the big business, politics, law, and media, the big four arms, what's going on between the, those four, right? Maybe if we start it now and we'll continue this after the break. Yeah, well, of course, that is the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Well, look, I'll tell you what, we'll have to start after the break because we're going to take it right now and we'll be right back, folks. Welcome back. So, uh, Seamus, just before the break, we started this fascinating subject around, I mentioned the four limbs of the state, big business, politics, law, media, and there's also revenue as well, right? Is there is there some connection between those five? And if so, to what extent and, and what's driving any connection between those five? 
well, from your perspective. Uh, yeah, from my perspective and, and, and uh, in, in my experience, yeah, the first four are certainly interconnected. Big business, as I said earlier, has far too much power. The corp- uh, you know, the, the corporate power has to be uh, reined in. Uh, it effectively means that corporations control government agendas. They control the agenda in Brussels. I've seen it over the last 25 years. I've seen how corp- corporations have gained control in Brussels. Uh, the media is very much captured, uh, like in, in my view and in my experience. Uh, I, I can quite clearly say that uh, RTE is, is, is more a, a puppet of state than, it, than it's carrying out its real responsibilities. I, like, I don't like to have to say that, but that's my, my experience. And uh, the fourth one was... The law, the legal system. Well, the legal system is a huge problem in this country because access to justice is impossible. We don't allow third-party funding in this country. We don't allow contingency fees in this country. We don't have class actions. For an ordinary person or an ordinary SME or a farmer to go to court against a, be it a, 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 a corporation, a county council, or be it a large corporation, a government, it is impossible. So what's driving the, that, that legal environment? As an ex-lawyer for myself who qualified in, the, in England, here in Ireland and Australia, Australia and I'd no longer practice. What, is there a fear in the profession about changing? What's driving that? Well, I believe from uh, some of the Supreme Court judges, um, particularly the, the, our, our new uh, Chief Justice, uh, they all appreciate the problem and they seem to be very genuine about that. Mm. And it, 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 there was a recent case where a company, a small company, tried to take on third party funding, uh, but the law says you can't, so the Supreme Court couldn't do anything and say, no, you can't. Mm. But but um, there, there has to be a move, and, and it'll, it'll need the judiciary to be involved to bring access to justice. At the moment, justice is just a barrier. It's the big guy knows he can use justice as a barrier to the small guy getting his rights or getting justice. But and, th- th- you mentioned there, you said farming, and do the farming or farmers not have like a co-op or an, a, a, a union or whatever it may be that they can then use them with the power of going and fighting whatever they need to, to fight? Well, unfortunately not. That's, yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, all the business side of farming has become corporatized. The, the co-ops have fallen into the hands of, of PLCs. And, you know, I would say that the, the main farming organization, IFA, have a lot of experience with it, has not um, effectively uh, represented farmers over the years. And that is why we are where we are today with farmers on mm. the streets. And they have a hell of a battle on their hands because massive structural changes has to take place in the whole farming sector. Yeah, it's, it's right across the board. It's across the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, whether it's in whether it's in banking or building materials or, or, or uh, in in farming, uh, there we we have to recognise that it's the socio economy that matters, not the economy. Mm-hmm. And for the socio economy to work, we have got to rein in corporate power because corporate power is based on one thing: greed and growth. Mm. You know. But, but it, it, the one thing, it, it, we you could sit here all day and we could talk till we're blue in the faces as well. And the only reason that it will not change if because there's not enough people f- find a need for it to change. Like a lot of people will sit and listen and talk, like, but they won't do anything to change it. Mm-hmm. And that's even with, with the way that people are, are being educated or not being educated about paying the mortgages or in arrears or companies who don't hide under the mat when the bill comes through. If it's like getting into people don't care there's not enough people to care to make the changes unfortunately people the vast majority of people the 60% in the middle or the 70% in the middle yeah. <coughs> seem to be oblivious to everything that's going on and they just come out and vote for the same parties and vote for the same thing all over again but like I do genuinely I, I, I blame media has a, has a huge role to play here mm-hmm. and in my view our national media is not doing the job that it's supposed to do mm-hmm. but yeah you're just talking to be fair you, and impartial and, and explain to the people what's going on I mean the people don't know, half know what's going uh, on in the banking sector yeah but I, I I, I disagree that we, you need media to do it because maybe 10, 20 years ago, if you wanted to tell a story and you went to media, it was a producer that made that decision and said no. Now you have the power of YouTube. You have the power of telling your own story. You have the power of, of <coughs> online. That if you want to get a message across, you, people with stories no longer need to rely on media because they can 
damn well do it themselves and tell those stories and there is fear oh big brother watching me or whatever forget all that you do it you get the message out there enough people share it they can't track it down and that's how you get that message and it's the consistency of it so if media is mainstream media is blocked I know people that don't listen to mainstream media personally myself I haven't read a newspaper in 10 years might be mad but I'm living a happier better life Mm -hmm because I'm not reading the newspaper, because I felt that the newspapers were depressing me, okay? But I get my information from other sources and I get it more reliable as well. You're perfectly right. And social media is doing a lot of work in in changing things. But the problem with social media is we're we're all talking to ourselves. You know, the Mm -hmm. 60%, the 80% that we want out there, they wouldn't bother with all this stuff. So, you know, gradually people are becoming... Yeah, we're talking to ourselves. Like I've one show that I that I have up on YouTube and it's got 7,500 views. One show. That's seven and a half thousand people on one show has heard my voice. Yeah. So if the message is strong enough and it's <coughs> passionately driven, people will share it and drive it. And if it and it's not just getting up there and saying it once, it's getting up there and saying it often. Because when you say it off consistently, you know to say you, we're all in sales. We know you need to hear something. You want to change someone's opinion. Tell them nine times, mm-hmm. and in the nine time, then they'll believe it. Yeah. Media has the power. Big, big companies have the power of doing that. That's why they spend money and fortunes on advertising. And because they spend money on advertising, there is why media, as you say, isn't doing it. Am I getting a, a, a hundred grand from a guy for advertising one of the ads, or am I going to listen to Seamus? There yeah. is that point of view. Mm-hmm. But if you want to get that message out yourself, it's the consistently driving on it as well. There's a couple I'm of off things. my soapbox. Now. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of big issues I'd like to, to address, and the first one is around housing mm-hmm. and and the pricing of the market and how, to me, as somebody who's just come back from Australia three years ago, how unsustainable it ju- it just seems. I mean, in Australia, you could buy a you know perfectly good um, prefabricated house for forty grand, you know, and and so there's all the issues around planning and pricing and stuff. And then the other, the, then the set we'll talk to both of you about that. And the second issue then is around the SME sector. How supported is it really in Ireland? Because I I don't see that much support. So the first thing is around housing and pricing and the government strategy. What's going on there, from from Rosalind, from your perspective? Well, you can see it all. You know the TV adverts now again. You know, get your mortgage, you get cash back after X amount of, of years and everything. It looks like the entire cycle is starting again. Um, I know it's a little bit more difficult now to get a mortgage, um, but you know it's still there. People are, are getting mortgages, um, but the houses are overpriced. The rents know. are even overpriced. The rents are ludicrous. Absolutely, like in Drogheda now for. A three to four bedroom house, you could be paying eighteen hundred to two thousand a month. Mm. So, I, a, I don't want to infuriate our listeners, but there's a program on television, Escape to the Chateau. You can buy a forty-seven bedroom castle one hour from the centre, from the uh, periphery of Paris, for two hundred and fifty thousand euro. It's. I think it's. I, I think <laughs> What's it's the going east coast. On? I think it's Dublin and the east coast. I think if you go to Wicklow or inlands, and everything seems to, like the, the country is balanced. It's tipping to one side. It's <laughs> tipping into the RSC. <laughs> yeah. It is. That, so you know, you can buy a house in in Carlo, or you can buy a house, an apartment in. You know, I have a house. That, you know, my house is in Tinnahili, and in Tinnahili, the houses there are, you know, four bedroom house. In Tinnahili is two hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, a, a, lot of it, a lot of it, Simon, is down to banking. I mean, people, people, very few people that I've come across ever know what's in Article Forty Five, Part Two, Subsection Four of the Constitution, yeah. which is about the control of credit, and it mm. says the control of credit must be done in the public interest. Mm. But what we had when we had private banks controlling the issuance of credit, they created an absolute orgy of credit. And that drove demand and drove the prices up. Mm. So we ended up with, with, with our, all our housing stock um, valued, uh, you know, way more than what it should be valued at. And that's that's the that's the real core of the problem. Mm. And the second thing is we could have and should have set up a, a special purpose housing bank uh, or a public bank. And we could and we can still do it. We can do mortgages at, at less than 2 percent, probably one and a half percent if we set up our own special purpose housing bank. So why isn't this happening? Well, we have spent the last four years uh, mainly through my association with Right to Homes, uh, lobbying all the parties in the doll. 
And the bottom line is that Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil don't want solutions. They just want to keep what's mm-hmm. there, there. It is awful simple. Can I say to you, Germany, uh, 70, 70, over 70% of the banking market in Germany is, is in the hands of public and community banks. Twelve and a half percent of the German banking market is controlled by Deutsche Bank, Commerce Bank, and the, and the, the uh, Pillar Banks. Mm-hmm. In Ireland, ninety-five percent of our of our market is controlled by Pillar Banks, who are for profit, for maximising profit, and they don't want change. And these are the powerful people. These are the people that have the lobby. So it sounds to me, from both of you, that the system here is just <laughs> just set up for inevitable boom and bust. It, it, it's, not gonna, it's not going to change unless there's a fundamental change to the environment. No, I just think it's just gone around in circles constantly. Um, nothing's, nothing really actively has been done by the government to fix the, the solution. And then you see tens of thousands, thousands of empty houses and apartments around as well, you know. Um, and again, adding to the, the list of, of um, homeless people in the country, which is mm. over the 10,000 mark mm. now. But mm. it's, it's, if you look at the way you're talking about boom and bust it's a 10 year cycle in this in this country 80s 70s 60s 70s 80s bust 90s it's every 10 years Mm -hmm. the and if you look out around dublin you can tell how well i always say how well dublin is doing the amount of cranes Cranes. that are up at the moment (laughs) but it's it's a 10 year cycle so do we as a nation of people understand that 10 year cycle and build for 10 years put our nuts in a safe place for when those five, ten years do boom, doom come and then because that's what it is, it's ten years on ten years mm-hmm. off and, and that's the cycle yeah, but you, you can't an and individual yeah. can't legislate against that because for starters if we put our money in the credit unions the credit unions are obliged to put the vast majority of the deposits on deposit with the pillar banks and now they've brought in these laws to do with bail in so the next time our banks go bust they're going to be lifting some of our deposits like yeah. it's, it's mad and, and mm-hmm. like government know that and they've taken no steps to, they've actually they, they, they have frustrated every attempt to sort out the banking market if I could just give you one example um, in, in New Zealand where they had similar uh, dominance by the pillar banks less but similar uh, in 1992 the government set up the Kiwi Bank so they converted their office post office network mm-hmm. into the Kiwi Bank which has really made the especially the indigenous economy thrive but we're closing down our post offices because why are we the reason we're closing them down is because um, uh, they are a threat to the banks mm. and that's the same reason why the credit unions are shackled because they're a threat to the banks like mm. it's mad what's going on in this country mm. it's, it's crazy uh, we're just going to take a quick break and we'll be right back and welcome back to business eye we're having a, a, a nice casual debate on our financial system here today and it's a uh, it's, it's quite interesting I just want to jump back into mortgage arrears and the issue that a lot of people are having at the moment on on, on it. Um, what's the age group that this issue is causing? It's obviously an older generation than a younger generation. Yeah, well, the majority of the people I would deal with would be in their mid to late forties, and a lot of people in their in their sixties, whereby they've retired now at this stage, but they they still have mortgages of two hundred and three hundred thousand hanging around their necks. Um, like some some couples would have started new businesses at the age of 50, collapsed then during the recession. They're now 65, 66 and owing 300 grand to the banks. So, you know, you can see that the uh, the, the ages are going between the ages of 40 to, to 60, really the people that I deal with on a daily basis. I don't have many young couples. Um, not yet. Not yet, but they may, they may approach me in the future. But, but the, the question that I'm asking is... Uh, did people not see? Did people not see the wood from the trees? And I mean that genuinely. That you know, you set up a business, which you mentioned. Mm-hmm. This is what are, you know they set up a business and they took that risk. Mm-hmm. And in life, there is risks. And if they had taken a risk and it had gone bust and they're spent, I've lost money. I lost nearly seventy thousand on a business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, I've, and the time that I put into it as well, you know, um, would would add up more on it. But I accept that. And I took it on the chain and went, right, I've screwed up here. Dude, is it a lack of education or is it people feel, okay, I've done this, I'm screwed now and I'm owed something? 
No, people, they they know their responsibilities and they are fully aware that they took out these mortgages, you know, to, to, to either fund family members for weddings and deposits for homes. That's another another issue yeah. where, where people borrow, borrowed money. Um, but I have not had one customer come to me and say, I don't want to pay this bank back. They all want to negotiate. They all want to stay in their homes. And really, I want to dispel the myth that no, no bank wants your ho- house back. They don't. They would rather negotiate and keep you there in, in the homes. Yeah, because a bank is, and, and we said it in the beginning, is a bank is happy if you throw something towards it and stick in your head in the sand. Yeah. So what's the issue then? Again, the arrears. So like, if you're 1,000 euro in arrears or 100 grand in arrears, you're treated exactly the same way. You get letters of demand, you get um, court dates, yeah, court proceedings issued against you. Uh, and then really the last step then is a repossession order which in some cases it has happened but, but if you're paying that money to them does this is this still happening it's still going around in circles unless the arrears have been have been but addressed if you're chipping away at the arrears um, they want you the banks want you to get into a restructure whereby it's all combined as one total amount and that's what you pay so they don't want you paying on your mortgage and then a separate payment going into your arrears they want it all fixed as one big picture and one payment going in but sporadic payments aren't helping the situation so if you pay one month and not the next month that's causing but if you're say say you owe two 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 grand a month yes okay and you owe 20 grand on your mortgage and you're paying 2200 on a monthly basis you're you're no longer you're, you're paying that and you're paying the arrears do they see that acceptable they do but they still have to restructure the mortgage to to reflect that so it's not a matter of you just sending in the money each month without the mortgage having been restructured. The arrears need to be capitalised right back into the, the total amount and one payment on a monthly basis. So it, there's no point in chipping away at it. You have to get the account restructured in order for legal proceedings to stop against you. Wow. OK. Interesting. So and is, is, sorry, and is that a criteria that if someone knows... You said it there, a grand or a hundred grand, it's the same procedure. It's exactly the same procedure, yeah. So it's the brutality of the procedure. It is, it's harsh, it's harsh, yeah. But again, this is all, you know, the, the mortgage arrears resolution process that the banks were issued with from the, the central bank and this is what they're operating under. So get a financial statement in, show what the customer can afford each month and restructure to that amount. But everything mm. has to be evidenced. And if, say, then the person comes in and writes a cheque to them and says, pays off the arrears, it all goes away then? It doesn't go away. It, it will it will pay off the arrears, but the account, as I said, it just it all needs to be totally restructured again. The, the environment to me just seems, we've kind of discussed it before, you know, as somebody who came back from Australia, uh, I never got a welcome letter from the revenue saying, welcome to Ireland, you're going to have to pay taxes here, but this is what we can provide support with. This is what your rights are. You, it just seems to be there's a lack of softness in the system. It's big business, the, the establishment against the people. Absolutely. That's the perception Absolutely. I get. And, and, and with regard to the banking side, this is all ECB agenda-led. It doesn't have to be this way. The banks are selling off loans by the billion, you know, packages of loans, a billion and two and three and four billion. Nobody can buy those, only vulture funds. There's no need for it to be like that. Like we, we had a problem with financing agriculture in the 20s and we set up the ACC bank. We had a problem with, agri- uh, with funding industry in the 30s, we set up ICC. Mm-hmm. We have a problem with housing and we should have a housing bank and we should be making loans available at less than 2%. Mm-hmm. And this nonsense of selling all these loans off to vulture funds, that's what it is, it's nonsense. Mm-hmm. So this, this is a, a deliberate agenda on the part of the ECB, which has been sold through the Department of Finance and the Central Bank and whoever happens to be the sitting Minister of Finance. What about, we, we, we started chatting about it before the break, the SME sector, right? So Joe and I run our own businesses and uh, so we see this from a, the small business perspective and you know, you've got all these multinationals here doing great things uh, and then I, then I hear, you know, some of these tech companies, uh, you know, have small business incubators and I've been to some of these and the banks have small business in- incubators and then I talk to the local L- Leo office and I, I just, are they really supporting small businesses? Are the multinationals really supporting small businesses? Is the government, you know, the enterprise office system really as simple and transparent as it can be for small businesses or is this, or is this just a lot of lip service in the market? Well, I, I think it's it's misdirected. They may think and they may hope to be helping small business, but the bottom line, small business needs funding. You can get a mortgage in Germany at 1.1% over 30 years fixed 
for 10 years. You can get business loans at between 1% and 3% in Germany. You, 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 you ring up the banks over here, look for a home improvement loan or these type of loans, and you're being asked to pay 12, 13, 14%. This is for money that's costing the banks nothing. So, like, this again is, is the nonsense. We, we are, we're top down in Ireland. We have relied on FDI. FDI is very good and it gives great jobs. It's here because of uh, tax reasons. We don't have to go into it, the, the exact argument about the, the corporate tax situation at the moment. But in Germany, it's different. They build from the bottom up. There's 3.7 million SMEs in Germany and they account for 99.95% of companies in Germany. That's from the German uh, Development Bank figures. And of that, 87% uh, of a turnover of less than 1 million. This, Germany is a micro-economy. And mm. we need to go back and look at Indigenous Ireland and start from the bottom. Huge, it, it, huge it's attention. A great point. I mean, in Australia, they have micro enterprise loans for startup businesses. And moving back here, you know, I started representing, you know, a handful of startup businesses. They couldn't get any money to start their businesses. You know, to go to you know private equity companies or whatever, you need to be oper turning over a hundred grand a year. You know, so where do those small businesses go for funding in Ireland? Well, we, we would have a multiple of the small business we had if we had a proper funding set up. There, there's a huge problem. The banks uh, are not giving credit, and where they are giving credit, it's it's way too expensive. How can we be paying 10, 12, 14 percent in Ireland and our counterparts in Germany paying less than three? How are we supposed to compete, and we're supposed to be in a single market? You keep driving back to Germany as an example. Is, is it because it's... We always know that one country will do great in one thing, but they'll probably screw up in three or four other things. And they're mm. probably... There's probably a show in Germany saying, in Ireland they're doing this about something, and why yeah. don't we do that mm. as well? Is it germ to German model, or is it just a select... Should we, should we be looking at Europe as a whole and re trying to get the whole balance changed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, very interesting because we are in the single market. Mm -hmm. Now, France has very low interest rates as well, and we are the dearest interest rates in Europe by, by a long way. But why I harp, I'm talking about Germany in the sense of the, the e economy and the socio-economy. The 70% of the German market that the public and community banks have, uh, that doesn't do speculation. That doesn't lend for speculation. It won't lend you for a second house that you want to rent out. Can I ask a really dumb question? Why are, why are we the most expensive interest rates in Europe? Why? Well, I, I, I can tell you why, because we're an island economy and we've had, uh, we've had uh, markets rigged in every sector right across the economy. We've had markets rigged. I don't want to start using words like cartels and all that because we shouldn't under, under public insurance airways. as well. Uh, we, like, we're supposed to have a single market. We don't have a single market for banking. We don't have a single market for insurance. We don't have a single market for pharmaceuticals. We don't have a single market for motor cars. We don't have a single market. Again, when I moved back from Australia three years ago, I was effectively lied to by an insurance company. I, I I had to pay something like two grand for my car insurance. Following year, I went to a broker, an online broker, that was more than halved, and they told me the information the insurance company told me when I arrived here wasn't wasn't correct. Mm -hmm. Look, we're coming to, coming to the end as well, but I want to I want to just ask both of you: what advice would you give someone in both of the sectors that you're working in? So let's start with with mortgage arrears. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give someone? Well, really, the best advice I can give is, um, you know, try and engage with somebody who is authorised and they they have a licence to do this. So don't just go to anybody willy nilly. You know, you need somebody with experience and and somebody who knows how to deal with the banks and how to complete a financial statement. Secondly, I'd always say make a payment, no matter how broke you are in a particular month. Try and get some sort of a payment into the bank. Um, be realistic when you're filling out your financial statement and you know there are certain guidelines that the banks give us to live by so you know don't be afraid to say that you you know you socialize slightly and you go out to the cinema with your kids you are allowed you're allowed you're allowed to, to kind of live your life as well yeah and yeah. where can people find you if they want to reach out and connect well they can find me on facebook the financial foundation .ie, um the website as well and the telephone number is 0419835710 www.thefinancialfoundation.ie Perfect. And yourself? In terms of advice. advice, you have one minute. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, honestly, I believe that the change we all require has to go back. We need political change. We need to change the um, the Senate. We need to we need to ban a uh, we need to ban the political parties from going into the Senate. We need to put in people with track records. Unless we get in at the top. And, and deal with the problems where we can deal with them. Nothing else is going to change down the line. Yeah. 
And where can people reach out to you if they want to speak to you? Uh, well, I, w- I, would, I would very much recommend people to listen to my uh, TED Talk, which yeah. is entitled uh, Ireland, Democracy or, Corp- or Corpocracy. Uh, but I'm on Facebook as Seamus May. I'm on LinkedIn as Seamus May. And I'm on Twitter as uh, ISBA. That's International Small Business Alliance. Um, I'm joint chair of the Public Banking Forum. So if you Google anything about public banking, you'll probably find my name there as well. Perfect. Simon. I just want to say we've been bashing Ireland Inc but Mick McCarthy has taken us to the Euros and we're going to win the Rugby World Cup <laughs> we better ring that rugby game <laughs> we better ring that, ring that rugby game tomorrow I'd like to thank both of you for coming in it's been an interesting conversation and uh, Simon great to uh, see you here again and my you. friend and, you. and we will be back next Friday again same time 1 o'clock live on 